Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary General of the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, Hassan Al Thwadi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to start, I'd like to apologize uh, if I look a little bit tired. I literally just got off a flight from Zurich, so uh, bear with me today and your patience up until we see our incredible ambassadors. Uh, today, I have the privilege of introducing four inspirational people who symbolize exactly what hosting the World Cup means to Qatar and the Middle East. As part of our C one of our CSR initiatives and uh, uh, titled Generation Amazing, the experiences of these young Qatari ambassadors, whom I'll introduce to you soon, exemplify why the World Cup is about so much more than just football. When we bid to host the 2022 tournament, we were determined to make a difference to people. We were determined to ensure that football makes a difference to individuals and enhances individuals' abilities. One of the ways we hope to do so was by empowering a new generation of leaders, capable of creating lasting change within their own communities. Four years ago, during our bid, our team worked tirelessly with respected partners to launch projects in Lebanon, Nepal, Pakistan, and Syria. Generation Amazing helped deliver football pitches and coaching programs to deprived communities in all of these countries. And our aim was to leave a genuine developmental legacy in the Middle East and Asia, regardless of whether our bid was successful or not. Now, fortunately, our bid was successful. And I'm proud here to stand here today to offer you a chance to learn and understand the continuing journey of Generation Amazing. Since we won, we decided we were, our determination was renewed to continue with Generation Amazing to ensure that it offers a sustainable, long-lasting impact within the communities of the Middle East and Asia. And our hope is that it lasts and continues beyond 2022. The focus isn't for it to continue just up until 2022, but for it to actually have a life of its own. This year, 22 youth ambassadors from Qatar, Jordan, Pakistan, and Nepal took part in a 13-day youth leadership expedition to Qatar before embarking on an unforgettable trip to the 2014 FIFA World Cup in Brazil. This marked the beginning of an amazing journey for the ambassadors as they developed their leadership potential meeting new people from different parts of the world, and having fun learning how to become an inspiration to their own communities. The experiences that they enjoyed will ensure their journey continues for a very long time. Just as I'm confident, our Generation Amazing Adventure will have a long way to go and will have a lasting impact on people's lives. Now, with eight years until 2022, we will continue working with established partners, including Right to Play, who I'm very, very happy and proud to announce that they're here with us today, and to build upon what we already have achieved over the last four years. Now, to tell you more about their amazing journey this summer, I'm proud to introduce our four generation amazing ambassadors from Qatar, who will give their own perspective of the experience. Accompanied by, prog by program manager, Rosa D'Alessandro, uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage Mohammed Al-Hennidi, Shog al Hajar Saleh, and Mahas Suedi. Now finally, before our incredible and amazing ambassadors share their experiences in person, I'd like to ask you to take a few minutes just to take a look at some of the highlights of the program. Thank you for your time, and I'm sure you'll be inspired by what you'll see and experience today. Thank you.
four of 22 Generation Amazing Ambassadors, all of whom managed to do what I couldn't do over the summer, was get to Brazil for the World Cup, and I'm extremely jealous. Uh, Secretary General, thank you very much uh, indeed for the opening remarks. And the Committee of uh, Delivery and Legacy, ladies and gentlemen, is essentially the organizing committee for the 2022 FIFA World Cup right here in Qatar. Uh, so guys, let's actually start with that. And um, I won't ask the ladies, Mohammed, but I will ask you, how old are you going to be in 2022? And what are you most looking forward to when kickoff happens? Well, yeah, I'm afraid I'm not going to do the maths now, but I think, uh, I think I'm going to be 24. And uh, hopefully I'm going to... I'm going to pursue a uh, career in international politics. I'm, uh, I'm really, you know, I'm really, I'm really enthusiastic about international relations. It's, it's kind of my passion. So uh, hopefully, I'm going to be something, you know, something like that. I aim to be an ambassador for my country at that time, and I'll be here. I'll be here, and I'll be watching. Hopefully. How do you ensure that you get a ticket? Do you beg? Because that's sometimes <laughs> what you have to do. I'm going to work hard for it. That's <laughs> that's for sure. That's for sure. Shuk, 2022, what are you most looking forward to? The world coming to your country or the football itself? What? Uh, everything I think in 2022 will be, uh, will be exciting and everything I'm excited to see in 2022. And probably I will be an engineer, a uh, biomedical engineer, and I could be working here in Aspire, helping the athletes, something like that. Haja, in 2022, I'm sure you want to be already scoring goals for the Qatar national team because you're a footballer, aren't you? Yeah. 2022 is a really exciting thing for the Qataris and all, all people in Qatar. I guess I will be uh, 22 years old and it will be really, really excited. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. Maha, what can you achieve in the run-up to the World Cup that will make the world proud of what Qatar has done even before the football starts? Well, personally for me, I'm already proud of Qatar so far and getting the bid as kind of the underdogs in the running. We're a small country, we're Middle Eastern Muslim. I think we're the first Middle Eastern Muslim country to host the World Cup. And I think it was amazing to a lot of people considering all the odds against, you know, the size and how we manage all that kind of stuff. So I'm personally, I'm already proud that uh, we're getting the opportunity to share our country with the world and getting to use sports as a means of uh, developing our country. And, and, and upcoming to 2022, our, our program is an example of things Qatar is doing to use um, the platform of 2022 to invest in youth, invest in leadership, and try to overall improve our country. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, these 22 ambassadors were chosen only earlier this year, uh, so almost in the nascent stage, you could say. Uh, Mohammed, they come from Nepal, Pakistan, and Jordan, and you couldn't almost pick three countries uh, that need the efforts of Generation Amazing to be able to help people engage in sporting activities, specifically in football, mostly because one of the reasons being, I suppose, is the difficulties that young girls especially face in these three countries to play football. Just tell us, first of all, about these other 18 that you all met when you went to Brazil. Tell us about the 18 that you met. <clears throat> of course, uh, well, these 18 ambassadors that we met um, come from a, you know, very, very poor and uh, low economically developed uh, communities. Um, you know, you, you got people from Pakistan, Jordan, and uh, Nepal. And, uh, you know, seeing the circumstances that they live in, uh, you know, they have, you know, lack of uh, facilities, lack of infrastructure back in their countries. Um, you know, they needed this program. Uh, they needed the, the, the support from, you know, from, you know, from us specifically. Uh, we thought that, like, we see ourselves as mentors for them because, you know, because we live in a country, alhamdulillah, we live in a country where we're blessed with all, you know, all, all of the structure, all of the, uh, you know, we have all the facilities, we have access to quality education, and, uh, you know, some, you know, these ambassadors actually don't have that there, and that's our role for this program. This program uses sport, uh, you know, to, for, for community development, and I think that, you know, uh, coming, you know, coming from, you know, having the, these kind of backgrounds, they actually needed that help. Um, and and about um, women's right, you know, women's uh, lack of participation in sport. Um, for example, in Nepal, 
uh, you know, the girls were the, the one, of, one of the main issues in Nepal, as as the you know as the girl ambassadors in Nepal mentioned, is that uh, you know they have kind of segregation when it comes to sport um, for girls. So these girls are not allowed to play football or any other sport in their communities because of you know because of the differences um, these communities have. Um, so I think that's you know that's these are kind of these are the kind of problems um, that kind of got tackled down um, in that program because you know this this, this program actually you know me, makes leaders um, out of out of these ambassadors that that you know that we met there. So, uh, Maha, did you get a sense from uh, the ambassadors from these three countries about what their most urgent requirements were and how they could use? sport to help their communities? Uh, basically every day we'd start off with uh, youth and leadership training before you know uh, going to the NGOs or attending a match or anything like that. So the primary goal of our trip was to empower other youth and give us tools in order to, to pursue different community projects. And what we did was we were split into four groups obviously per country typically in these presentations where each country would talk about the different social issues they face. So for example, Nepal uh, girls talked about how they didn't have the specific facilities or the, the um, support that they were hoping for in terms of being able to participate in sports. And uh, there was a similar case like that in Pakistan. And so we kind of as a group collectively brainstormed on, okay, how will we raise um, more awareness about this issue and provide girls uh, an equal voice in sports because you know that's, that's amazing and that's something that we should all encourage, of course. And so now we have Generation Amazing Ambassadors like Munan Nepal, who's organized the first girls tournament in her community, in her village. And so I think that with these different kinds of opening this dialogue between youth and giving us a platform to really figure out how we can make a difference is really important. Absolutely, and I'm, I wanna pick up on that Nepal issue that you talked about because this is absolutely incredible. So what these ambassadors are doing in these three countries is that they're organizing football tournaments, they're uh, trying to help, um, I suppose, put the finishing touches and improve certain facilities that will not only help for sport but obviously for development as well. And uh, they're trying, of course, to include as many young people as possible, people who might come from divided communities. The idea being, I suppose also in Jordan, that at the end of the day, if you play sport with somebody, you're less likely to hate them. So it becomes almost a kind of conflict resolution through sporting activity. The Nepal stat that I found absolutely stunning was that over 800 people turned up for just one presentation that an ambassador was giving. 800 people. That shows the power of Generation Amazing. Shook, did you get an idea from the girls that you met about their frustration that they couldn't participate the way they wanted to? Uh, of course, like we were from different cultures and from different countries. So different problems were every country faced and like maybe shyness or maybe like wasn't encouraged by other people. It's just a habit or in their countries. To do their to do what they want in the in the way they want it, so probably the the 63 hours of the leadership skills and teamwork and how to collaborate to achieve something that we did there was probably helping them or help even us to to, to, to communicate with other people to do what we want and to be leaders to guide our community to do that in the future hopefully. Rosa, could you tell us if Qatar itself is spending money on these projects? Just hold the microphone slightly Sorry. closer to you. We made um, a commitment back in back in the bid, as um, Secretary General said. We we picked up um, this project in 2010, and we've revisited it. and And the idea is that this is sustainable. We are going to invest in um, pitches. What we found is that clearly football is a way to communicate and a way to talk. So these communities are completely behind these ambassadors. So our investment is um, around making football and the football facility the focus so that our ambassadors can train other young people and engage with other groups and, and use that as a focus, as an ongoing focus. We don't wanna be there in 2022. We need uh, these communities to be self-sustaining and, and it's for them to kind of take this forward and they're empowered to kind of use the facility 
say what they need and what they want. Pakistan's a good example. The opportunity for girls is limited. We create a space, um, we have some kind of segregated changing facilities, suddenly this space becomes accessible. Suddenly they can use it as a, as a community resource. So it's about how you use football, it's about how you use that resource going forward. So our investment is key, it's, um, but it, it has to be sustainable. So it's about empowering those communities. And these guys are just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, stunning in terms of how they've kind of switched on and, and using the power of sport, but just you know what it, what it epitomizes in terms of teamwork and collaboration peaceful resolution like you say it's just you know why wouldn't you talk football it's great and they had to be am i right between 14 and 16 when they were chosen yeah. and that is an incredible age and yeah. actually you know what it makes a difference to what you do later in life you may think okay it may not have that much make that much difference in 10 or 15 years time but it really does and i'll tell you my personal story off stage afterwards about how it made a difference about what i was doing at your age. Rosa, is there any chance that these four are going to be going to any of those countries uh, to see the projects for themselves? Without committing in public? I mean, great, we'd, we'd love to. And I think um, what we've been really lucky to have with this cohort is a real passion. These guys aren't going to go away. They've got commitment to the program for a year. Um, part of this um, uh, event today is about their role in advocating you know, sport as a, as a tool for change and they're gonna to continue to do that. And you can tell in, in their personal lives how this has had an impact. So all of their, th their, their dreams and thinking for university and, and what they wanna do with their lives. But this has been a touch point, I believe, um, in terms of how, how they're gonna use this experience. So it's, it's a really, really positive thing. To answer the question, we'd love for them to come back. And, and you know, the, the dialogue continues. Because they've um, separated and gone back to their communities, we, we still talk. We have a little Facebook group. There's a lot of chatting that goes on, lots of selfies uh, posted. There's pictures everywhere. So that's a really good virtual community that these guys are engaged in, so. Okay, so just before the World Cup, the 22 ambassadors uh, from uh, Lebanon, Nepal, and Pakistan, uh, Jordan, excuse me, they came here. You met them all. And then you went to Brazil, and as I say, I can't believe it. I've seen some of the matches that you attended, and I watched them on TV, but you guys were actually there. Haja, what was the highlight of that trip for you? For me as a footballer, <coughs> for me as a footballer it was a really nice thing to see uh, World Cup matches. Uh, I get the opportunity to see uh, the World Cup matches in the field. I'm seeing the, the best footballers in the world to perform and the best careers in, in front of me is to take me even further to be a professional footballer. It was absolutely inspirational, I suppose, was it? To yeah. see, you saw the Netherlands, uh, yeah. you saw Chile, so you saw already yeah. Van Persie, Robin, Uruguay, Alexis Belgium, Sanchez. Yeah, South Korea, yeah. Just fantastic. Yeah. But there was another purpose for the trip, Maha, correct? Uh, yeah. That mm -hmm. you were meeting uh, three NGOs in particular Tell us about those experiences. Yeah, of course. So we actually did get to see Suarez score two goals in, the, in one of the first matches that we attended. I just wanted to bring that up because I thought that was amazing. But um, the main purpose of our trip was to go and learn from these different non-governmental organizations, such as Epricad and the Kafu Foundation, which is founded by Kafu himself, a legendary Brazilian footballer. And uh, we got to visit each of these NGOs that work directly with Brazilian youth in the favelas of Brazil and use um, these platforms, these organizations to empower them and give them different facilities and try to essentially take them out of their social issues and empower them against them. So we got to see them in action. We got to meet some Brazilian kids our age. Even though we could barely understand each other, there was a huge language barrier, but we still got to, we got to play sports with them. And I think Football, you, like football, gave us a, a common, like a sharing point between us and and these different kids who are going through kind of similar experiences across the world. So it was pretty amazing. Uh, these uh, other ambassadors, uh, the 18 of them, they've been engaged in leadership training ahead of uh, Brazil 2014. Uh, they've presented their football uh, ideas, development programs. Uh, aspirations to their local communities. What, Mohammed, would they have taken from the three NGOs that you guys met in Brazil back to their countries? Were there things that they were particularly touched by that they thought could work back in their homelands? I mean, uh, yeah. As, as, I, as I mentioned before, um, you know, the, the whole purpose, the sole purpose of the, of the program is to use, you know, uh, sport for community development. 
And I think that not only the 18 ambassadors, but ourselves too. We all, uh, you know, we all are going to use this experience in, uh, you know, in doing something in our community. I think the most thing that they're going to, you know, they're going to focus on, especially looking at the NGOs that we went to, um, the NGOs that we went to um, try to, you know, tackle uh, social issues such as drugs, uh, you know, gangs, all of these kind of issues that are in Brazil um, in the favelas. But looking at the looking at the backgrounds of our um, of our ambassadors in, in Pakistan, uh, Jordan, and uh, and Nepal, um, all of the training, all of the leadership training, everything we discussed, um, you know, through 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 the thirty six hours of leadership training, is going to be really beneficial for them um, to start something in their community. So um, so for example, uh, you know, Basalt, one of the Pakistani ambassadors, has um, has created a football tournament um, for not only uh, teenagers but for adults too. And uh, you know, he kept hosting these different tournaments to keep you know, to keep um, the, the you know the teenagers and to keep his community um, away from the you know away from the social pro problems that they have. And um, for example, and and even in Jordan too. Um, one of the ambassadors in Jordan has discussed um, the problems um, in their community um, in, I think, Al-Mafraz. And in, in Jordan, in it, for, for, the, for, the, for the ambassador himself, he discussed something about his community having a problem with a neighboring community. So what the, the resolution for that is that he created a football tournament that brought, that brought the two communities together to play football. And I think that's, that's key you know, in, 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 in the world right now. Um, he, you know, they use their experience to, uh, to bring people together and, uh, you know, they, they use the leadership skills that they gain from the program, from all of the activities that we did, all the football matches that we did. Because, you know, if we, if, you, if we look at ourselves um, in the trip, we played a lot of football games. But, you know, the purpose of these football games is not only fun. We look at, ourse we look at ourselves as a team, you know, ev and every team has, like if we look at it in a football perspective, Every team has to score goals, and uh, you know we have we have a motivator, which is our, let's say, coach, right? And uh, our coach here was the SC, and we were the players, and uh, we needed to help to help each other in the program, you know, to score a goal. And that goal is to take the experience back to our countries to actually accomplish something. And that's something that these ambassadors and us are doing uh, right now in our communities. Um. You mentioned, uh, Maha, about Nepal and uh, the first ever girls football tournament there, which was actually organized by one of the Generation Amazing Ambassadors. She, she was one of the youngest ones as well. I mean, pretty dynamic young lady, pretty dynamic, yeah. Absolutely incredible. And also the first ever football tournament in Nepal to be organized by essentially a child, right? Not an adult. And I suppose being with... Uh, do you know who this is? Marcos Evangelista de Moraes. Have you ever heard of that name? That's Kafu. That's his real name, right? <laughs> they all have these really long names, Brazilian footballers, and it's reduced to about four or five letters. Do you know why that great footballer Kaká is called Kaká? His name is actually Ricardo, but his younger brother couldn't say Ricardo. He said Ricaca, Ricaca, Kaká. So Kaká became Kaká. You know? So hanging out with someone like Kafu must have only inspired even more ideas for all of you guys and also for the projects that might be undertaken. Uh, Haja, as a footballer yourself, did you actually kick a ball with Kafu? What was it like being with him? We, we've been the Kafu Foundation. Yeah. Been, uh, we've been the Kafu Foundation. We, we were seeing Kafu himself uh, helping his community by making this foundation, by seeing the kids in this place playing football with him. It's, it's take me even further to, to be a professional footballer and I, I want to help my community by sports for development and this kinds of things. Maha, did he just spend a few minutes with you? Did he shake your hand and say, thanks a lot, great work? Or did he actually talk to you and show you around the foundation? What happened? Well, obviously we still had the language barrier. None of us are fluent in Portuguese. As or Italian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we got to interact with him. He um, obviously introduced himself and he signed some of our jerseys, our Qatar football jerseys. And we took a group photo and he actually um, played uh, football with some of the kids. And uh, he taught one of the Generation Amazing ambassadors, the Capoeira, which is a Brazilian dance. And uh, he helped us. Um, in one of the video, in, in the video, you saw a part where all of our faces are spray painted onto a wall and he actually came and helped us with that 
So that was pretty cool, which is at his foundation. So there's a lasting, literally, picture of Generation Amazing in the Kapu Foundation, as you can see on the screen. And he, he, like, he interacted with us for a long time. It wasn't just a hello, hi, thanks for visiting my foundation kind of thing. And I, you could tell from the kids' faces that everyone was so inspired, especially the people who really have a passion for football, like Hajar. You could tell that it meant a lot to them to meet this legend. Yeah, and also Again, you've done something that I haven't uh, done. You know, he played for Roma. I lived in Rome for almost two decades, and you know, it's one of my favorite clubs in the world. What a legend he is! For Shuk, for you, was the highlight uh, football or something else that you learned while you were in Brazil? Yeah. Also, when we see like uh, somebody like Cafu who just funded this uh, organization just to get the teenagers out of the street and into education and employment and the other organization, for example, UNESCO, that that most reason was like to get people to, ha to people to have a safe place space. So they are using sports to develop their countries and using sports to fix the issues that they, they had or they faced over there. So it's really inspiring for us as teenagers or as a, uh, to be a leader in our communities and to lead our country to the best community and without problems, hopefully. What did you feel uh, about your fellow ambassadors in those other countries talking to you about the dangers of engaging in sport? Because uh, for girls, there may be the pressure from families. For boys, in some parts of the world, it's you know simply a danger to go out and engage in sport because of the way some elements of society regard those activities. Did any of those fellow ambassadors talk to you about any of those concerns that they might have? Mohammed? I think that they actually did. Um, as I said, through um, you know, the leadership activities, we had, we had a lot of discussions. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time with, with these ambassadors. And uh, you know, they kept talking about um, what prevents them from actually doing the thing that they like. Other than football, there are a lot of stuff that they like, and there are a lot of um, factors, you know, affecting them for not doing the stuff that they like. And um, you know, we try to advise them, and we try to, you know, we try to understand, because uh, you know, um, that was the first step of understanding. We wanted to know what was wrong. You know, they talked all about, um, for example, uh, there was a social issue in Nepal about drinking. So one of the ambassadors was discussing how, um, you know. Some of, like, some of his family members, for example, uh, were getting drunk, and you know, that was a problem to him. So I think understanding these problems were, you know, were the first step to, uh, you know, to, to, to make them lead the way to change in their communities. Uh, guys, if you're happy, we'll take some questions from the floor. I believe we have uh, a roving microphone. So if you'd like to ask any of the ambassadors any questions about uh, Generation Amazing, just put your hand up and... Uh, someone with a microphone will come and see you, okay? And in the meantime, uh, we'll continue. Uh, Rosa, what's the next uh, sort of milestone for Generation Amazing? Uh, is there something specific, a get-together planned, or a project that's about to start that you need some sort of marker laid down for? So, um the ambassadors, um, as you said, have recently selected. So we've had an amazing six months. We've been to Brazil, come back, and uh, the community action plans are now in place. So the next key milestones is to put in this pitch infrastructure. So we are active now in Nepal. So that's literally coming out the ground now. So um, some pitch upgrades are, are underway. Um, and we've got plans in the next few months for um, Jordan, Pakistan, and more in, in Nepal. So. We hope that uh, some of the guys may be able to join us in celebrating the launch of that, that stuff. But, you know, it's while, while this has become a focus point for um, not just the ambassadors, but those communities, we were keen to kind of get in and make that kind of statement and give that resource um, to the community so they can just start and um, get behind it. So that, that's, that's kind of immediate, the next six months. Our ambition is to kind of repeat the cycle. Um, so, you know, we, we've seen what works. We understand that the power of youth and the power of their passion, and it doesn't matter if you are an ace footballer like Hasho, who is an ace footballer, um, or you've never kicked a ball around. It's kind of understanding the, the, the power of this communication. Um, you know, it's, it's completely generated from a community need. Um, so the community are telling us this is kind of 
what the issues are. We want somewhere safe, somewhere focused um, for our young people. And the young people are just running with this stuff. So hopefully a repeated cycle of activity. And, and this has to be sustainable. It's, um, it's not for us to kind of be there holding hands. And that's not what any of us want to do. All the ambassadors, it's, you know, they, they, their skill is um, kind of sharing in part in what they've learned and, and allowing other people to kind of use the spaces and use the learning. So this thing will roll and roll, I hope. Raising this kind of awareness among uh, young people of the power of sport uh, for peace and development is going to be extremely important in terms of just getting the message out to as many people as you can. Maha, can you tell us about this youth declaration that has recently come about? And it was with uh, an NGO called Rota. And also tell us about Rota. So what's this youth declaration about? involvement with Rota, first of all, I want to thank Rota for uh, Rota give, is. Uh, Reach Out to Asia, which is an organization that's based here in Qatar, but obviously has further aims to help the region. And so, first of all, I just want to thank them for giving us the opportunity to work with them because that was honestly a huge part of what we did and a precursor to what we did in Brazil. And then we, fr we furthered our support after we came back. So initially, before we went to Brazil, we spent a whole Saturday um, me and the me and my fellow ambassadors here from Qatar, and we went over the uh, Empower Youth Declaration, which was created at the Empower Youth uh, Conference that Rota hosts, hosts every year. And so we got to go over all the different um, ideas of the youth at this conference, which talked about what they want to see from stakeholders, such as governments, non-governmental organizations, athletes, on how we can develop the community using sports. And so. We essentially went over this declaration and added our own opinions on what needs to be improved or what we think should be emphasized and all that kind of stuff. So we gave them further feedback. And then um, after we came back from Brazil, we actually got to um, sit with Her Highness Sheikh Al Mayasa and present the final outcome of the youth declaration. And now it's currently being shared with various United Nations agencies and NGOs. and. So I, I'm really proud of our involvement in that. And I think that's an amazing step to be able to say that as youth, this is what we hope from our community and from different, you know, from different roles in our community, what we expect them that, from them specifically. What sort of impact do you think a statement, a declaration like that can have on the ground? Well, I think for a lot of governments and different organizations, the voice of youth isn't necessarily interjected in what's currently being, um, being uh, organized or, uh, or put into place. And uh, people keep saying youth, you know, the, the country's new generation, the next uh, generation of leaders. And it's really important for us as youth to be able to give our feedback and actually propel our voice before we become the leaders and try to uh, further um, demonstrate our role within society and, you know, our feedback on different kinds of issues. Guys, thank you very much indeed. You know, the power of football is uh, you can never, ever overestimate it. Uh, in the 2006 World Cup, during Argentina's first two group matches, not a single crime was reported in the capital of Buenos Aires, which means everybody was watching Argentina. That's what football can do. Thank you very much indeed. Generation amazing, ladies and gentlemen. So there are a lot more programs uh, coming up. Guys, you can uh, come off stage. You don't want to be listening to me. Uh, later this afternoon, uh, there's going to be a lot more coming up. The Friendship Tournament at 4 o'clock to 4.30. You can play table tennis with the 18-time uh, world champion, Dr. Yaping Deng. Uh, they're going to be the task force sessions, which are between 2.30 and 4 o'clock. Uh, spreading sports culture across the MENA region. There's going to be the first ever open session for you to talk about whatever you think is important. Uh, there's also one called It Takes a Village, and that focuses on the new initiatives for fostering sport as a community leader. Time out later. He's sitting here in the front row with Mr. Dikembe Mutumbo, eight-time NBA All-Star, and Veronica Campbell-Brown. And that's this little taster of what's coming up after lunch. See you later. Thanks a lot. Jump in the sky, put them in the sky. Chuckle on the wall. Hang with them side to side.